First question. Uh, when did you start Alternative Radio, and why did you start it? In 1978, I volunteered at a community radio station in Boulder, Colorado, KGNU. And that's where I got my um, initiation into radio. I have no background or any other kind of uh, training. I started doing a program. I was very unhappy with the corporate media and the very limited perspectives that uh, it was presenting. And so I decided to do something on my own as a kind of uh, counter or a tonic to that uh, toxic waste that's produced by uh, corporate controlled media. So I began alternative radio locally in Boulder, Colorado, and then nationally and internationally uh, in 1986. Uh, and so 2011 is going to mark the 25th anniversary of uh, alternative radio. That's great. Not part of the interview, but I remember when you were in Astoria, I told you that back when I was in college, I called and ordered a tape, I think on the Iran-Contra affair, I'm like, you answered the phone. And yes. <laughs> it's changed. All right, well, let's see. So what does, a similar kind of question, um, what, what does alternative radio mean to you personally, and then what does it mean for us as a people? Well, I'll answer the second part of your question first. Uh, for uh, listeners in the United States and around the world as, as well, it presents radical points of view that are either completely marginalized or eliminated in the mainstream media. So getting voices out such as uh, Tariq Ali, uh, Arundhati Roy, Vandana Shiva, not just American voices, but voices from uh, West Asia and South Asia. Uh, I travel a lot to Lebanon and Syria, and Egypt, Pakistan, I've been to Afghanistan, Nepal, India, I've been many, many times. So I want to get perspectives from those countries, that part of the world, as well as from inside the United States to rock the boat, to, sh to just shake the kasbah a little bit because people are way too complacent. Uh, they get a very narrow perspective of news with a range of opinion from A to B. So you can you know, choose between uh, Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and people like that. Uh, I want that horizon to be broadened, and I want to inject radical ideas into the public discourse because uh, the conservative ideology, conservative ideas are dominating the discussions, even in the so-called liberal media, because the so-called liberal media, I don't consider them liberal, that would be National Public Radio and PBS and the New York Times and the Washington Post, embed assumptions about capitalism and imperialism that are never challenged. And I want to deconstruct those assumptions, challenge them, and strip them of their mythology. So I'm a kind of striptease artist. That sun came out hot. Are you good? Yeah, we're fine. Okay. We're fine. Um, <clears throat> just some more, a couple more here. And... So then, what? Go ahead. I was going to say, are you going to ask any more questions about public radio? Because I have uh, one more. It okay. had to do with the, with the uh, court, the Supreme Court's judgment <coughs> call on being able to uh, fund elections. And also, this is there anything you could say about the media? conglomeration that's been going on. So I think it was the Clinton era where they took away the ownership thing. So now, like what I'm seeing right now is... Okay. Ben Bagdikian is an independent journalist, and he wrote a book called The Media Monopoly. This is in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. And he noticed a trend in U.S. media. He found that more and more of American media was controlled by fewer and fewer corporations. And he said, you know, this is a cause for alarm. We should be monitoring this and, and see what develops because it has implications for the communication needs of a democratic society. So he wrote his first book. It was called The Media Monopoly. And he identified 50 corporations that had a dominant control of the media in the United States, 50. Okay, there were subsequent editions 
of the media monopoly. That number 50 went to 28, 28 went to uh, 14, 14 went to 10, uh, 10 went to 6, and now there are about five corporations that have a stranglehold on what most Americans see, hear, and read. Uh, you have a tremendous amount of political illiteracy in the United States, historical amnesia. One has to understand why is that the case. I believe that to be true, incidentally, as I travel extensively around the country and I find levels of information about U.S. history, about foreign policy, about the domestic economy are very, very low and inaccurate in many instances. And I think that's largely due to the corporate control of news and information. Now, the Supreme Court ruling in January 2010, Citizens United, has had an, another, is it almost another body blow to the whole notion of democracy and audio democracy. Um, we still have semblances of democracy in the United States, but I believe that democracy as it really is, not how it's uh, projected and presented by spinmeisters, is in the ICU. It's in terminal care. Uh, there, is a, there is a pulse there, but it's very, very weak. And this most recent decision that I refer to, Citizens United, is another huge blow uh, to democracy because it has unleashed torrents of cash into an already saturated political system, that is, cash-saturated political system. It's not for nothing that uh, uh, w people quip that uh, we have the best system money can buy. Now, uh, Citizens United decision gives further embodies in law the notion that corporations are persons. And if they're persons, then they have First Amendment rights. And money is free speech. So money cannot be then regulated. There can be no controls on it. Does this decision serve the communication needs of a democratic society, or does it further inhibit it? I think very strongly the latter. And one only has to examine the results of the 2010 congressional elections to see that money more than ever uh, dominated many of the outcomes. Not every single one, but most of the victories by the uh, Congress in the, in the Congress and the Senate were driven by outside capital, by corporations who are not giving money because they like this or that candidate. These are essentially payoffs. I'm giving you money because I want results from you. I am expecting X, Y, and Z. And you better pay off because I've, you know, I've spent a lot of money on you. If not, you know, you're out of there uh, come your next election uh, cycle. Now, the current tsunami of mergers and takeovers and concentration uh, in the media uh, was enabled primarily by, I'm putting this in quotes, the liberal Clinton-Gore administration. Uh, I remember vividly uh, in 1996 when they proposed the Telecommunications Reform Act. This word reform has a very particular meaning in U.S. political vocabulary. When citizens hear it, they should be leery. They should be wary. There's, something's going on here. Because reform has a, a great, we're all for reform, right? We want things to improve. But the way things have evolved in the American political system, uh, reform has become a code word for handing over uh, public assets to private corporations. Like Social Security is spoken now as reforming Social Security. What do they mean by that? They mean privatizing Social Security, which I think would be a, an enormous uh, catastrophe for the American people. So in 1996, the so-called liberal Clinton-Gore administration proposed the Telecommunications Act. I remember at the time they said that this act 
will lead to a multiplicity of new media, a proliferation of media. It will democratize the media, it will open up the spectrums, it will, you know, there'll be more and more uh, competition and on and on, and people bought it. Okay, they bought it, it was passed by the Congress, signed by Clinton, there was a great ceremony, a lot of hoopla about, wow, this is the dawn of a new era in media in the United States. Well, you know, we've had now uh, 14 or 15 years to examine the evidence of what that legislation produced. And it has produced exactly what Ben Bagdikian and others have been document documenting. More and more takeovers, more and more mergers, more and more con concentration. It has produced the exact opposite of what it, what it promised. Blackboard, or we can all see it really clearly. All right, I'm going to um, go into Iran. We'll kind of just bounce around a little bit. Um, did you uh, have you been to Iran? Yes, several times. Most recently in 2007. And what was your your experience there as a culture? Um, a lot of folks who call for military intervention kind of see you know the women are oppressed and. Uh, they don't have certain freedoms, this, that, and the other thing. What would you say to people who argue, uh, use that as a case for military intervention? It's a false case. Uh, it's, it's cynically and hypocritically using human rights and rights for women as an excuse for intervention. I mean, the idea that the U.S. military is interested in women's rights is... I mean, it's laughable. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. I mean, if one believes in that, you believe that pigs fly? I mean, maybe they do. Maybe you can make a case for pigs flying. I haven't seen any evidence. The U.S. military is not, as Arundhati Roy of India has said, a feminist organization. It's anything but. In fact, it's noted for its misogyny and for the number of rapes and attacks on women, American women, in uniform, I mean, this is well-documented, violence and intimidation of women uh, in uniform. So the idea that, they, that the U.S. cares or the military cares about what's happening with women in Iran or Afghanistan is just absurd. If you really want to look at an oppressed women's uh, culture, go to Saudi Arabia, America's great ally, or Kuwait, or Oman, or Qatar or Bahrain, uh, those kinds of places uh, in the Arabian Peninsula where there is an enormous amount of uh, misogyny and uh, patriarchy. Uh, I often make this kind of analogy uh, to explain what I mean. If a Saudi woman today were to wake up in Iran tomorrow, she would think she's landed in heaven. That's how open Iran is compared to uh, Saudi Arabia. So one has to be very careful about falling into the propagandistic traps that the media and the White House and the State Department lay for the American people. Of course, we're, we're all for equal rights, human rights. You know, we're also for them here in the United States, uh, where there are, you know, serious uh, problems, uh, economic as well as uh, social, that should be addressed. But this Using these types of tropes are just excuses for imperial intervention. Um, so, let's see, should, uh, should the global community allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon? The global community is a term of propaganda. I would immediately challenge the use of that word. When the U.S. says the global community or the international community, what, what does it really mean in practice? It means the United States and those countries that go along with the U.S. line. That's the, that's the international community. So uh, Iran is accused of perhaps developing uh, weapons. Okay, let's, let's concede the point. Let's say they are on track to develop nukes. Am I in favor of that? No. I'm not in favor of any country having nukes. Now, what three countries that are closely allied to the United States 
have nukes are not signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and therefore are not subject to any kind of inspection or monitoring. What are those three countries? India, Pakistan, and Israel. So Iran is being held to a very high standard. Uh, and these other countries, which have nukes, are getting a free pass from Washington. Now, people in West Asia and South Asia and other parts of the world see this and just see, see it as utter double standard hypocrisy. Why is, why is Iran being held to account when these other states, which have weapons and have exploded weapons, atmospheric testing, underground testing, and crucially have the ability to deliver those weapons? See, now Iran may be developing a bomb. That would be one part of the equation. It's quite another part to be able to reduce the weapon to fit on the, the head of a ballistic missile. So that's another stage of technology which could be a years away. According to U.S. intelligence reports, Iran is still several years away from that kind of capability. Now, why would Iran, let's again concede the point, that they are secretly developing uh, nuclear weapons? Why, well, why would they do that? Maybe they saw an example in neighboring Iraq where the United States felt free to conduct one of the most brazen imperialist interventions, uh, certainly since uh, the Nazi invasions of Norway and France and Belgium uh, in the 1940s. Uh, if Saddam Hussein, in fact, had nuclear weapons, there would have been no way the U.S. would have invaded Iraq. They knew he didn't. They knew the propaganda that they were disseminating through the corporate control media was an absolute fabrication and therefore felt free to invade Iraq with no threat of any kind of retaliation of, that would be significant. So Iran saw what happened in Iraq and is, has taken that, that lesson. If Panama had nukes in 1989, would George H.W. Bush have invaded Panama? Maybe not. Maybe he would have stepped back and wait a second here. They can, hit, they can hit us and hit us hard. What about Grenada in 1983 when Reagan invaded what was described as a national, the national interest of the United States? Uh, again, he felt free to do that. The attacks and wars on Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Dominican Republic. I mean, the lists of U.S. interventions and invasions are so extensive that I could literally speak about them for hours. Yet most of that history is occluded, obfuscated, masked over by textbooks, by the educated class in this country, which exerts an enormous amount of influence on public opinion, the corporate control media. <clears throat> what about um, the recent history of Iranian interventions? Iran has not intervened uh, formally in the affairs of any state in 250 years. So there is no comparison between the record of U.S. intervention. Notice that Iran borders with Afghanistan on, the, on its east and Iran on its west and south. So it has deep historical... I just cut you off. I, I, Iraq, Iraq on the west and south. I know you said Iran. Okay. Notice that Iran has borders with Afghanistan in the east and Iraq on the west and the south. It has strong civilizational, cultural, and religious ties uh, with those countries. When they are involved, as they should be in the, in the affairs of their, of their immediate neighbors, the U.S. calls that meddling. It calls it interference. Then what exactly are American troops doing in Afghanistan and in Iraq 8,000 miles away from the United States. 
So, See, yeah, those are, those are the kinds of contradictions that are never challenged, are never raised in public discourse. <coughs> those are the kinds of contradictions that are never challenged or, range, or raised in public discourse because they are like what Orwell calls inconvenient facts. So the U.S. military, the war machine, kind of really seems like it's gearing up towards an invasion of Iran. <clears throat> We're surrounding Iran with military bases, troops, etc. Is war with Iran inevitable? Nothing is inevitable. Uh, what is going on right now, before I s talk more specifically about Iran, is the expanding U.S. war on Pakistan, the expanding U.S. war and interventions in the Horn of Africa, specifically, uh, well, Yemen and uh, Somalia on the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So there has been a huge increase in bombing attacks, interventions, use of special operation forces uh, in those countries. Uh, Pakistan is also a neighbor of Iran's. Part of the eastern frontier of Iran is with uh, Pakistan. Uh, Iran is completely surrounded by U.S. forces, naval armadas. Uh, the U.S. has complete control of the skies. It has satellite monitoring uh, devices, uh, you know, monitoring every move the Iranians uh, make. But Iran is not Iraq. Iran is not Afghanistan. It's a country of 70 plus million. Uh, it has capabilities. It has allies. Uh, it has, uh, I would say, uh, kindred spirits in neighboring countries. And don't forget that the U.S. would be very vulnerable uh, military, militarily, uh, if the Strait of Hormuz were to be closed or blocked, even temporarily, this is the major outlet for uh, oil from the Persian Gulf uh, out to the rest of the world. Uh, this could have an enormous economic in impact. So if the U.S. were to launch, or its ally, Israel, which is a proxy uh, for the U.S., were to launch any kind of military action uh, on Iran, uh, the consequences would be enormous, and they could quickly spin out of control. How, how much um, oil and natural gas does Iran have, and how much is all this about that? Iran probably has the second largest reserves of natural gas and oil uh, in the world. Uh, certainly, it's a major factor. If all they had were grapes and pomegranates, uh, it would not be as obsessional as it is uh, for Washington. But there's an important other historical and geopolitical issue. The Shah was a very close ally of the United States. He was installed by the United States in a military coup that incidentally was prompted by the forerunner of BP, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, which later became British Petroleum, then became BP. Iran had a democratic prime minister in the early 1950s. His name was Mohammad Mossadegh. He had very funny ideas probably because he was educated in France, so you know what that means. The Sorbonne, logic, rational thinking, you know, really off-the-wall types of things. And so he thought, radically, that Iran's oil wealth should benefit the Iranian people. I mean, what an idea. I mean, this guy clearly didn't understand uh, the realities of uh, geopolitik, right? Uh, because at that time, 100% of the profits controlled by the British-run Anglo-Iranian oil company was going back to London and to banks in New York. So he said Iranian wealth should benefit the Iranian people. He nationalized the oil wells. This created huge consternation uh, in Britain and the United States because this virus could spread to other countries. 
and they think all of a sudden that their natural resources, you know, be it tin or iron ore or manganese uh, or whatever, belongs to those countries rather than to their rightful owners, uh, the corporations uh, in the West, in the United States specifically. So in 5152, <coughs> so in 1951-1952, Harry Truman was the President of the United States. The British Prime Minister then was Winston Churchill. He was urging Truman to crush the Iranians, to launch some kind of intervention, to roll back this very ugly precedent that Mohammed Mossadegh had engaged in. Truman would have none of it to his credit. Uh, he saw that you know the British were you know just thinking about their own profits for their own uh, oil company, but then in 1953 when Eisenhower comes to office and the Dulles brothers become dominant in his administration, John Foster Dulles is his Secretary of State. Alan Dulles is the head of the Central Intelligence uh, Agency. Both of them fanatical anti-communists. So what the British did very cleverly to appeal to their new audience was present this as within the Cold War paradigm. So this was all about the Reds. This was all about the Russians moving into Iran, that Mossadegh was a communist, uh, that you know it was going to fall under the Soviet sphere of influence, and the United States had to do something about that to prevent it. And so they did. They launched Operation Ajax, uh, CIA sponsored and organized coup uh, to overthrow the democratically elected and popular government of Mohammed Mossadegh and reinstall the Shah who had fled the country uh, in disgrace. He was denounced as a puppet of, of the West and not really a, an independent leader of the Iranian people. So the Shah has flown back from Rome where he was in exile and sat upon the peacock throne where he ruled for the next 25 years. Now, this is what I'm talking about when it's not just about oil and natural gas. It's also about hegemony and control and vengeance. Punishing Iran for overthrowing a very close ally of the United States. Uh, the Shah of Iran was like a cash cow for the U.S. military-industrial complex. He was buying billions and billions of dollars of weapons from U.S. war weapons uh, manufacturers. And he was uh, a local cop on the beat. He was uh, guarding U.S. interests against the rise of independent nationalism in the adjoining countries. And so they've never forgiven Iran for overthrowing the Shah and the Islamic Revolution, and that's also part of the equation, to restore a compliant, servile, subservient regime in Tehran that will answer the bidding of Washington. Yeah, well, this is good. You're crossing off a lot of my questions. <laughs> that's good. Cool. I'm going to add something. Add something. Cameras recording. You just want to add first? Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, all of this uh, information is documented in my book, Targeting Iran. And it's essential, I think, that the American people understand what happened in 1953 when the United States, which purports to support democracy, in this case, destroyed democracy in Iran. Now, when the people uh, of BP and the Wall Street bankers might argue that they put up the money for the oil exploration, the development of the wells, so they should get a return on their investment, and that by nationalizing the oil, uh, that they were kind of getting screwed on the deal, if it were. What do you say to that argument? Well, I'm not going to defend uh, the you know particular nationalization, but certainly the bulk of the revenue should go to benefit the people uh, of the country rather than to the corporate managers in New York and London. Great, thanks. Um, this could be short, 
I know you're not a military planner, but what would an American Iranian conventional war look like? A U.S. Iranian uh, war would be unconventional because the tactics and weapons are would be different. Uh, that is to say, uh, Iran would u- perhaps revert to a type of guerrilla warfare. It would use its assets in Afghanistan and in neighboring uh, Iraq to attack U.S. bases and uh, U.S. forces in a kind of um, extended guerrilla warfare. Iran has virtually no navy to speak of, no air force, so they can't fight the U.S. on U.S. terms. Uh, So it would be a different type of warfare. It would be the kind of thing, perhaps, that what the Taliban is doing in uh, Afghanistan. But inside Iran, it's worth pointing out that, you know, if the U.S. actually invades Iran or its proxy invades or bombs Iran, this will set off a huge uh, firestorm of protest and opposition. It will further cement the notion that the U.S. is at war with Islam, that it's at war with Muslims, it will be, Iran is not, no country is ordinary, but Iran is extraordinary, uh, let me say. It, it is a 5,000-year-old civilization. It is one of the oldest cultures uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the world. And they have a very strong, Iranians have a very strong sense of who they are. They're very proud of their language, their poetry, their uh, contribution contributions in music and architecture, in other cultural fields. There's a very strong sense of uh, Iraniyat, being Iranian. And so even, I suspect, people who are opposed to the Islamic regime would not welcome, many of them, some would, I suspect, as well, would not welcome any kind of U.S. military intervention. Iranians I spoke to In 2007, when I traveled around the country, and I did have access, and I speak a little bit of Farsi so I can, you know, carry on a bit of a conversation, Uh, they said it would be the worst thing in the world for uh, the the democratic movement in in Iran if the U.S. were to intervene. And, And other people told me, you know, every time militant statements are issued from Washington, about, you know, Iran has to do this, Iran has to do that, Iran, Iranian behavior is not acceptable. You know, I mean, first of all, it sounds like the U.S. is some principal or headmaster in a school, you know. Your, accept, your behavior is not acceptable, you know. You have to do a lot better. You know, I'm going to give you a D on your report card. Next time I'm going to call your mommy and daddy to school and, you, you know, you're going to get a spanking. You know, that kind of a, a very condescending behavior toward a people that represent a very deep and proud cultural tradition is unacceptable. And so people told me in Iran, every time there's a provocative or hostile statement coming out of Washington toward Iran, the leadership in the country turns the screws on the democratic elements saying, you know, you're enabling this. You two are connected. The pressure we're getting from the United States is directly, you know, connected to what you're doing inside the country. So it actually undermines the possibility for democratic change in Iran. Which may be the objective of the war planners. Well, the U.S. is clearly not committed to democracy. It has set up a protectorate in Afghanistan. It's, it's almost, again, it's risable. Uh, you have rigged elections, bought votes. Uh, the puppet there, his name is uh, Hamid Karzai. He's, I think a former Unical oil uh, consultant, may have been also a CIA asset uh, at one point. Uh, he's one of the most corrupt leaders on earth. Uh, in I- Iraq itself, we have been the handmaidens to a new dictatorship there. A sh- basically Shia-based, uh, led by al-Maliki. So clearly we're not spreading democracy, we're actually limiting democracy. And uh, to go back to the 1953 coup uh, in Iran, 
significant on other levels. It was the first major destabilization operation of the CIA, and it was to inaugurate a, a, a series of U.S. interventions and coups just the very next year. Another democratically elected government, popular government, in Guatemala, uh, Jacobo Arbenz, was overthrown by the CIA. So again, you know, as Howard Zinn likes to remind us always, uh, if you know a little history, they can't pull the wool over your eyes so easily. So when American presidents, be they Obama or Bush or Reagan or Kennedy, say that the United States is committed to democracy, the red flag should go up to, in, in the citizen's mind. Wait a second. What about democracy in Chile? Weren't, wasn't that a democratically elected government? Wasn't Salvador Allende elected? Didn't the CIA destroy democracy in Chile and in other countries as well? Aren't we, this, aren't we supporting an undemocratic regime in Egypt under Hosni Mubarak, who also rigs elections? Aren't we supporting a homophobic, misogynistic, feudal dictatorship in Saudi Arabia? So, for uh, Ahmadinejad, like Kennedy and Bush accused of stealing elections themselves, along with Ahmadinejad. So that is that hypocritical then for Americans to point at him, Ahmadinejad, stealing, being accused of stealing the election as a reason for intervention? Well, almost at the very same time, uh, the election occurred in Iran in June of two thousand and nine. A couple of months later, there was an election in. Uh, Afghanistan. And uh, after that, there was an election in Egypt. So it's interesting to compare how these elections were dealt with in the corporate control uh, media. There was a lot of attention paid to the Iranian elections and irregularities in the elections. Supposedly, uh, there were, you know, votes were excessive in certain districts and, and things like that. However, even more egregious rigged elections occurred in neighboring Afghanistan and as well as in Egypt. In the case of Egypt, the opposition candidate was actually in jail. He was put in jail by Mubarak. That is Ayman Nur, who is with the Rad or the Tomorrow uh, Party. So how can you conduct an election with the uh, opposition candidate uh, in jail where Egypt is still operating under emergency laws, which means any gathering of more than five people is technically illegal. Protest is illegal. Demonstrations are illegal. There's censorship of the press. There's massive human rights violations in Egypt. I'm not saying that they don't occur in Iran. They do. But look at the attention paid to Iran and compare that to the attention paid to Egypt. And I can... I think you can draw some very important conclusions that this type of coverage and this type of media coverage and the political attention is completely selective and is based on strategic needs of the empire. Since Egypt is in Washington's pocket, since Saudi Arabia is in Washington's pocket, no attention and no censorship uh, will is, is required of those regimes. Since Iran is independent and outside the scope of the U.S. orbit of power, it is to be punished. Its transgressions are to be highlighted. There's to be, the, you know, the Klieg lights are to be turned on Iran and they're, be, and they're to be turned off in the case of our putative allies. Um. Uh, in his book, The Grand Chessboard, Vigny Brzezinski uh, claims a Western takeover of much of the Middle East and the so-called Asian Balkans is essential for the continuation of U.S. hegemony. Um, and his reasoning seems to be that if we don't do it now, uh, dominate that region now, that China will do it in the near future. So the question is, should the people of the United States be afraid of China getting unencumbered access to the oil fields in the Middle East, and therefore support the U.S. domination of the region? Imperial America is in sharp decline. Uh, this has accelerated certainly since 
uh, 2000, 2001. The invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq are enormous catastrophes. The expansions of, of imperial interventions in Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia, other parts of the world, are all contributing to a rapid uh, decline in uh, U.S. Uh, political as well as uh, economic power. China is being uh, used now as the new raison d'etre for U.S. intervention in Central Asia and in South Asia. Obama goes to India, one of the poorest countries on the face of the earth. 800 million Indians are living on 50 cents a day. It's not much. It, there are more poor people in eight provinces of India than in all 26 countries of sub-Saharan Africa. That's, how, that's the extent of poverty in India. What is Obama doing in India? He's not talking about poverty. He's talking about eliminating what? Not eliminating poverty. Eliminating, I'm quoting, the scourge of terrorism. And he's there like a prostitute hawking his wares. You know, not you know, showing a G-string or a garter belt. He's selling weapons. That's, and he's really fulfilling his role uh, as president of the United States, one commentator called, the president of the United States is essentially the CEO of corporate America. He's there doing the bidding of Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and Raytheon and Honeywell and the other uh, components of the military industrial complex. And the other goal in terms of U.S. policy toward India is to enroll India into an anti-China military alliance. So China is clearly the new kid on the block. It will quickly replace Islamic terrorism as the uh, reason, as the justification for U.S. imperialism. In fact, if you study Pentagon planning documents, they're called, it's almost laughable, there's very little about al-Qaeda or what we do, what talk about as terrorism. It's mostly about China. They're very worried about the long-term threat of China. And so uh, the idea of using China as the, you know, the, new, the new Cold War, the new Soviet Union, the new communism, I mean, the American people should be able to see through this claptrap. You know, it's a bunch of rubbish. You know, we should be not a, a superpower militarily. We should be a humanitarian superpower. Obama, in his August 30th, 2010 address to the nation, said that he wants to make the U.S. military uh, the, the greatest fighting force in the history of the world. Now, why didn't he say that about our educational system or our health care system or our libraries or our social services? Why aren't we number one in education, number one in health care? Those are not priorities. Those are not things that would benefit the American people. Of course they would. Who benefits from the permanent war, war machine? Who benefits? This is a very important question to ask always in any discussion, political, geopolitical discussion. Who's profiting? Is it the American people in whose name these interventions are carried out? Are we the people benefiting? Or is a handful of elites or a few corporations, you know, reaping the profits? I think the, you know, the answer is self-evident. The people are not, ben the people are suffering. It's, you know, it's their sons and daughters who are fighting in these imperial wars, defending corporate profits, all, of course, rhetorically in the name of defending freedom and democracy and the free market. These are all terms of, propaganda that, you know, just, it would have made Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda, just, you know, blush in envy. My God, these guys are like so sophisticated. We were like crude pikers. You know, all we had was a few newspapers and the radio. These guys have got the internet, television, you know, they command, you know, the airwaves. So is the uh, Obama administration line on Iran the same as the Bush Rhetorically, it's not as brusque and aggressive. This is one of the major dis distinctions 
between the Obama administration and the Bush administration. Uh, the vocabulary is, has been considerably softened. Although they both use this very deadly and threatening term, all options are on the table. Now, when a mafia boss calls in a shopkeeper who's not making the monthly payments for protection, you know, like I'm, I'm let's say I'm the capo of this particular district. I'm the chief mafia and I want to get, you know, some money from you every month so that nothing happens to your shop. We wouldn't want a bomb to explode or an inadvertent fire, you know, to happen to destroy your business. So you pay me money to make sure that that doesn't happen. We have a, you know, a certain uh, arrangement. So U.S. foreign policy is very much like that of the mafia. In fact, Noam Chomsky makes this uh, analogy that if you step out of line, if you suddenly say, hey, Mr. Mafia boss, I don't think I'm going to make these payments anymore. I'm independent. In fact, I'm going to break away from you entirely. That's very threatening to Mr. Mafia boss because it's the threat of a, of a successful and good example. If one shopkeeper says, hey, he's no longer paying, why should I pay? That guy stopped paying. Well, it means that the mafia boss is very weak. This could get out of control. This is to say that the U.S. foreign policy operates kind of like the mafia model. And Cameroon? I had uh, very interesting interactions with Iranians when I was in uh, Iran. And, you know, it may also be connected to the fact that I have somewhat of a reputation as being a dissident media worker in the United States. And I'm also from that region. My parents are from uh, Turkish Armenia uh, in eastern Turkey, in, Anatol in Anatolia. Uh, in 1915, uh, there was an organized genocide by the Turkish government of the Armenian population. Uh, many, many people were killed. Others were driven into the desert. My mother's family was. Uh, my parents met in Beirut in 1921. Uh, got married, and then they came to uh, the, to New York, where I was born in 1945. And I've always kept connections with the region, so I, I felt I feel a kind of affinity, and it's not uh, something that's constructed or something that I feel is artificial. It just comes naturally to me. And when I travel to other parts of the Middle East. You know, I feel a connection. You know, I feel some kind of a kinship with the culture, and I'm very interested in the politics and the history and the languages, as well as I don't speak them anywhere as well as I'd like to. Uh, and all of those things, I think, uh, help me uh, integrate more uh, and, and have some degree of, allows me to have some insight because people are more open. They don't see this kind of um, a brusque, intrusive, invasive foreigner who knows everything, has nothing to learn, and proceeds to lecture them about the, how they should behave. You know, the, the kind of uh, imperial attitude which the British were infamous for. And now the Americans have just replicated and adopted and continue. Uh, Iran is, is a very diverse country. Uh, it's multilingual. Uh, it's, uh, it has Arabs, for example. It has Turks. Uh, the Turks they speak Azeri, a Turkish language. Uh, they constitute the second largest group uh, in the country. There are Baluch. Uh, there are uh, many Kurds uh, in Iran. So it's multilingual. Um, very, very diverse from region to region, uh, but there is a there is a sense of Iranian identity based on the history of the country. There has been something known as Iran or Persia for something like five thousand years, so that gives them a great deal of pride uh, in their country and their civilization. So I was able to. 
uh, talk to a lot of people in Iran and get you know different different viewpoints. Uh, I didn't feel inhibited in any way. Uh, I didn't feel threatened. I was able to move around uh, without any um, difficulty. And so, um, you know, I think this is important for people to understand the other, not just to demonize a putative foe or enemy, you know, like in Orwell's Animal Farm, you know, four, uh, two legs bad, four legs good. That means like all humans are evil, all animals are good. You know, that kind of black and white thinking, Manichaean thinking, it's very, very dangerous and leads to just horrible outcomes, you know, as we've seen, particularly during the George W. Bush era, because that rhetoric became very prevalent. There's good on one side, there's evil on the other side. We're on the side of good. We must eliminate evil, as if God or some divine will has ordained uh, the United States to be the instrument for eradicating uh, evil. My contention is that these are all excuses to justify imperialism, uh, domination and control of other countries and other resources. And uh, Iran is, is not simply going to lie down uh, if it is attacked. It's going to, uh, it is going to resist, and it will resist in very uh, innovative and improvisational uh, ways that cannot easily easily be um, countered. Does that mean, does that increase uh, the chances that the U.S. would drop a nuclear bomb on Tehran? The possible use of nukes in Iran, I think, is remote, very remote. Uh, it would have catastrophic consequences and would lead to just unimaginable uh, outcomes. Uh, suffering, war. I mean, the population of Tehran is approaching 20 million people. Uh, are you suggesting that incinerating 20, 20 million Iranians is in the national interest of the United States? National interest, incidentally, is another term of propaganda that should be exposed whenever it's mentioned by any political leader or a commentator in the media. The national interest means the interest of the few corporations and the military industrial media complex that dominates uh, the system in the United States. Is there, um, with the economy of the United States so dependent on oil, um, on your tours, you're flying around, planes are burning oil, we're eating food from an agricultural system based on oil, uh, our cameras yeah, here, got the point, oil. got Is the point, hypocrisy there on those? Of course, there's a great deal of hypocrisy when it comes to the use of fossil fuels, but unless we recognize that fossil fuels are without question unambiguously contributing to global warming, to cl climate change, uh, we are not going to make any progress on this extremely important environmental issue. So efforts need to be made to minimize use toward eventual elimination of fossil fuels. Uh, the Pentagon, incidentally, no radical green organization, uh, issued a report a couple of years ago saying that environmental issues is the single most important national security threat to the United States. That report was buried and unreported on, basically, in the media. Okay. Um, the war machine, incidentally, is the single greatest polluter in the environment, the Pentagon. These, you know, jet planes, the aircraft carrier battle groups, the submarines, all of them contribute enormously to environmental degradation. So that's another argument to shrink the military, not just to uh, de-imperialize U.S. foreign policy, but to further, you know, contribute to, to improving the environment. It's 
very, very uh, important area. Let's see, we're <coughs> about 10 minutes. Um, I just want to touch on a couple things. Uh, of the Iran-Iraq uh, war, Henry Kissinger is quoted as saying, it's a pity they both can't lose. Why would you want that outcome? And can you talk a little bit about the Iran-Iraq war and the U.S. position on both sides? In September of 1980, Saddam Hussein invaded Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded Iran. It was a blatant act of international aggression. The armed forces of one country crossed the international frontier and invaded Iran. What was the U.S. response to the invasion? Utter silence initially. There was no Security Council resolution brought by the uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. to condemn Iranian aggression. Uh, again here, there are textbook examples, contrast. What happened when Iraq invaded Kuwait? Very interesting. There were immediate Security Council resolutions passed condemning it as aggression, as it was, and sanctions were imposed on Iraq. Now, how is the invasion of Kuwait an oil-rich ally of the United States in August of 1990, different from the Iraqi invasion of Iran in September of 1980. They are absolutely identical in terms of international law. But in the imperial equation, one had value to the U.S. empire and one did not. And so the U.S. was quite happy to see Iran being punished, being invaded. Mind you, this is about a year after the Iranian Revolution. U.S. hostages are still being held in Tehran that were seized uh, at the U.S. Embassy, the 53 hostages. So there was total silence on that. And then when Reagan comes to office in January of 1981, a secret arms supply, not so secret, Rumsfeld is designated as a special ambassador to Baghdad, goes to Baghdad, meets with Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, shakes his hand, and arms start flowing to Iraq because the U.S. sees Iraq as the, the good side in terms of its interests, even though Saddam Hussein was the same evil dictator, the same human rights violator as he was a decade and then again two decades later during the first Gulf War and then the second uh, Gulf War, the second war on Iraq. So, I mean, Kissinger himself is a major war criminal. Uh, I would not, you know, use his name uh, to justify any kind of policy. Uh, he is the incarnation of Machiavellian uh, skullduggery uh, and is indirectly and directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Laotians, Vietnamese, and Cambodians, uh, responsible for the coup d'etat overthrowing Salvador Allende uh, in Chile. I mean, the, his record uh, is arguably one of the most venal in U.S. history, and the bar for vin venality is very, very high when I say that. Can you talk about... Um the crimes that Saddam was hanged for, and then a little bit on the Iran-Contra affair? Saddam Hussein was principally uh, prosecuted for and uh, executed for the Halabja attack on uh, Kurds in northern Iraq in 1988. I remember the incident very well. The Washington's position was the Iranians did it. They immediately wanted to deflect attention from its ally, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, to its designated enemy, the hated Iranians. Uh, 